Yesterday, you heard a lot of very moving stories, stories about courage, individual risk, people putting themselves on the line. And underneath all of that, you heard from a lot of younger people who are masters of the technology that you saw I am not master of yesterday, um, saying, no, it, yeah, the technology is great, but it's really about the people who are willing to go into the street and risk themselves. And, and for those of us, and there are many of us, not all, but many of us in the audience who come from what's called the West, which is you know, Europe, the United States, Canada, Australasia, Japan, a lot of the West isn't in the West, bizarrely enough. Um, uh, we're quite comfortable, really, in saying, we hope these people are going to do well. You can just feel that undercurrent in what people from the West say. And I must say, my feeling is, yeah, in some ways we're doing pretty well, but I don't think from the point of view of freedom of expression we're doing particularly well. I think there's a very limited use of freedom of expression in the West. We have all these constitutions, all these guarantees, all these rights. We don't see high levels of participation, of uh, joining up in any sort of way. We know that there's dropping voting uh, levels everywhere. And over the last decade, after 40 or so years of, of, of really banning in our minds a certain kind of populism, ugly negative nationalism, uh, racism, gradually these things have been creeping back. So that when I write sentences about what's going on, I've had to keep on over the last 10 years adding in an adjective, you know, first nationalism is coming back, and then ugly or negative nationalism, and then adding, well, populism is back. In the last five years, one has been obliged to add in that racism is back, that, 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 that it has become respectable to say racist things in a great deal of the West. Sometimes it's a little more sophisticated than it used to be, but it's back in politics. Everywhere from politics to dinner conversation, people are saying things that they would not dare to have said 10 years earlier. And so I think all of this is tied to a curious form of sophisticated censorship in uh, the West. I mean, obviously people say, well, that's got to do first with perhaps media concentration. And it, I'm not going to talk really about that. I mean, it's obvious that there's been an enormous rise of media concentration. What's fascinating is people just say it and move on, as if it didn't really matter. Uh, the politicians are frightened to take it on. The journalists are frightened to take it on. The employees are frightened to take it on. So it just sort of rolls on, getting more and more concentrated. And we know that it's limiting, not simply what's said, but the way uh, it's said. You ask, well, where does all of this come from? What's really happening? Well, I think in part it's coming from the fact that over the last 30 to 40 years in the West, there's been a, an acceptance that the way things run is that economics comes first and everything else comes out of economics. You get economic success, economic efficiency, uh, people are reduced to sort of stakeholder status within society, interests become the driving force within society, and that becomes an undermining factor in the whole concept of the responsible citizen, the responsible engaged um, individual. And that is in turn tied to what I would call the growing culture of managerialism. Now this is, it's 9.15, and this is the most boring thing you're going to hear today, and yet it is absolutely central to what's going wrong. That we have convinced ourselves in our universities are rolling down this road, not just with the business schools, but with all sorts of management and administrative schools, and redoing the way in which we teach virtually everything so that it comes through a kind of utilitarian, linear, administrative approach, that that is the sort of philosophical core of the way in which we're teaching our kids today. You know, get a kind of administrative approach towards life and get a job. And that growing culture of managerialism with the, the educated, the middle class, the upper middle class moving into managerial structures, public, private, uh, both equally, is I think at the core of what's going wrong. You, you'll see this is sort of battle inside education between education, i.e. thinking and questioning and being a citizen, versus education, utilitarianism, specialization, getting a job. And the utilitarian side of education is winning out. The training side is winning out. And tied to that is, of course, something that's very valuable, specialization. We all want the man or woman who operates on our heart to know where the ventricle is. Right? So we want specialization, but that is gradually becoming an excuse for, for not helping people understand the larger picture, the picture of what it's like to be in a humanist society in which you have 
all-encompassing responsibilities as a citizen to act and to speak out. And you actually see, and we're going to have a very active professor speaking, but you know, if you look at the percentages of, of engagement of professors with tenure, with guaranteed employment, and compare it to the rest of the population, you'll find that the professors with guaranteed employment who were given tenure, not so they could be happy, but so that they would be free to speak out, you'll see that the engagement of professors is below the national averages of most countries which gives you a little hint of the kind of problem that we've got. And so what, what am I talking about here? Well, managerial structures are based on loyalty. They're based on loyalty to the inside. Specialization inside managerial structures are all about your, your loyalty, your part of the structure. You've developed dialects, They've, you know, little dialects in social sciences, in history, and medicine, so you can't even talk to the rest of the people inside your structure, let alone be involved in public uh, discourse and public debate using one's freedom of expression fully because that would be betraying the sophistication of the way in which you have to speak as a specialist. You'd have to reduce yourself to a dumbed down level. I mean, this, is, this whole idea that in order to speak to a large population you have to dumb yourself down, right there you see a very profound form of censorship. Because, of course, if you can't communicate to other people, if you can only speak in a dialect of a specialist, you're functionally illiterate. That's functional illiteracy, to not be able to speak to people who don't know about your area. It's a lazy, intellectual laziness, which is all about inward looking. And that's what's happening to those who are educated and in positions of authority in our Western societies. So, we have these gigantic, uh, corps, cores of bureaucracies in the public and the private sector. Uh, the atmosphere discourages them from speaking out and from differing with their colleagues. Loyalty is a sign of intelligence. That's another sign of the big problem, this idea of loyalty to one's core. That's something that goes back to the Middle Ages, which we thought that we'd gotten rid of. Uh, they're embarrassed to speak out in public in a way which separates them from their uh, core. But beyond that, is this amazing thing. In most countries, even in the United States where it's sort of disguised in a way by private education, the taxpayers basically pay for most of the education. And yet the first thing that happens when kids graduate from university is they get a job. And one of the key things that happens when you get a job is either formally through uh, uh, an employment contract or informally, you give up your freedom of expression. Which is to say, by going to work for whatever it is, it is assumed or written down that what you know is the thing that you will not, and for which you've been hired, is the thing about which you will not speak in public in disagreement with the people who've hired you. So we go to all this work to create an expert in bridges, and then for the rest of their life, the expert in bridges can't speak about bridges in anything except a stakeholder manner. That's censorship. The single biggest uh, tool of censorship in Western civilization is the employment contract. Nobody actually thought their way through this, that we would educate ourselves to an incredible level and then shut ourselves down as a debating society through utilitarian mechanistic things like employment contracts written or assumed. So this idea of loyalty goes right back to the pre-democratic period. If you actually analyze loyalty versus disloyalty, those who have been against freedom of expression have always based their arguments on loyalty. Those who have been for freedom of expression have always said disloyalty is the essence of the active citizen. We are not afraid to be disloyal. Since we as citizens are the guarantor of the state, the state and the spokesman of the state cannot say to us that we are traitors to the state. We are the state, and therefore we can be disloyal in any way we want. It's not up to employees or elected of the state to tell us what we should be saying or not saying. And perhaps all of this, what I've been describing, explains why after 9-11, all around the world, there was such a push. It always happens when there's a crisis. You, the doors open for the security forces. They come rushing through and they occupy space. Forget about the real crisis. They just occupy space as much as they can, which they did. And since 9-11 around the world, you've seen barriers to taking away freedom of expression fall one after the other in the countries of the West with there being virtually no discussion, no argument, because it would be a sign of disloyalty, if not of treason. So let me just finish by giving you two examples of this. One is the, the inflation of secrecy over the last couple of years. 
I mean, I'm going to give you American numbers because the Americans are honest and, and very specific and co count the number of secrets, whereas everyone else actually hides them. Uh, the, the number in 1996 for the number of documents rendered secret at some level or another uh, in the United States is apparently 5,685,000 and whatever. Uh, the number in 2009 is 55 million. And I could go on and on about what that means. And the result of that is that the Pentagon alone has to ha give clearances to 630,000 people to have access to various levels of clearances. What I'm describing here is the breakdown of the idea of transparency and public debate, that everybody is sort of brought into a system given certain bits of access but not other bits of access, which makes public debate virtually impossible in a sophisticated, real way. And, and it has to do with the loss of transparency and the feeling that if you tell them too much, citizens will be disloyal. And then the last thing is, you know what happened in Japan with the nuclear industry. Um, this is just the latest example of this. We've had 60 years, you could be for it or against it, but 60 years of nuclear energy without there ever being a serious, calm, citizen, informed debate on the subject. Why? Because the people who know are not able to speak, and therefore, we've, all we have is these kind of uh, uh, emotional debates. The knowledgeable people who won't explain versus the people who don't know, who can't explain, but have feelings. 60 years with something as important as this and not a proper debate. That tells you what I'm describing is actually happening. So what I'm saying is happening to some extent everywhere. It's an elite problem. It's a problem of the elites giving up on the idea of transparency and democracy. Uh, and ending up in a kind of idea of freedom of expression which is more about distraction than about discussion. And all I want to say is this. Sophistication, social sophistication, intellectual sophistication is great, but it actually is one of the signs of societies in deep trouble. There was an old French phrase which is le mieux est l'ennemi du bien, the best is the enemy of good, to which I would add that social sophistication, political sophistication can very easily be the enemy of freedom of expression. It can be the friend of sophisticated censorship. Freedom of expression is a rough and tumble business. It's ugly. It's hard to live with. It requires very thick skin. It's often very wounding. It is the font of culture and of successful, balanced civilizations. Thank you.